In this next video, we'll continue to discuss the effects of Buddhism throughout Asia and the spread of Buddhism along the Silk Routes. And I'm going to use the term Silk Routes because thinking about there were a lot of different trade routes that moved throughout Asia. So there wasn't just a single Silk Road, although we do tend to say Silk Route or route or uh, silk road and give this idea of a single path. However, you can see from this particular map, it was much more varied than that. So we'll start off thinking about Buddhism moving into Afghanistan at the trading route of Bamiya and then spend most of the video thinking about how Buddhism became established in China. So you can see from this map how it is moving from northern India to the area of Afghanistan, into Southeast Asia, into China, and eventually into Korea and Japan. So the next video will think about how Buddhism is adopted in Korea and Japan and how the art is produced there and what it looks like. So just zooming in to the trading post of Bamiyan, looking at these Bamiyan Buddhas, um, they are very, very famous for the fact that they were destroyed recently. So in 2001, these colossal Buddhas that were part of a series of uh, rock cut caves, so caves that were carved into the living rock, there was a long tradition of this in Buddhism as we saw with the caves of Ajanta. These were actually developed around the same times as the, as the caves of Ajanta, so around that Gupta period. So we do see the Gupta style for the Buddhas that we see here, these colossal Buddhas. Uh, however, at this site, when the Taliban was in control, they made the decision to destroy these Buddhas. There was a long history where uh, they had actually been probably damaged deliberately. Uh, so, for example, the faces, there's some debate whether there were masks or some kind of other material that was used to cover the faces, but most likely this is a previous instance of what we call iconoclasm, the, just the deliberate destruction of images, uh, often for a religious purpose or a political purpose. In this case, there was probably a little bit of both. Most people talk about the idea that the Taliban is uh, is an Islamic group, is um, it's a group of Muslims, and so you have individuals who are against representation of the human form, and then of course this is a Buddha, a figure associated with a different religion, so this idea that these figures had to be destroyed. But the reality was it was doing that, it was destroying these figures uh, that were associated with another religion, but in addition to that it got them a lot of political attention as well. So there's always this idea that in the destruction of art, you can get attention, you can draw attention to your cause. And so uh, many art historians have stated, yes, there was a religious reason to this. And it was based on an idea that the human form is often rejected in Islamic art. However, that's not always the case, and uh, there was probably a very strong political reason for doing this. Uh, and the Taliban actually kind of alerted people that this was going to happen, and so many museum officials were begging them not to do it, were asking them not to do it, uh, and the responses were very interesting. They would say things like, well, these Western institutions will do anything to save this art, but they won't help um, a starving child, or they won't help people that are dying in Afghanistan, and that's the reality of what they needed at the time. So it did make a really big political splash when this happened. Um, so the largest of the Buddhas is about 175 feet tall. It was created again out of the rock of these cliffs, but then also decorated or the texture was added through ropes and plaster and building up the surface texture. So you can see the before, the destruction, and the after. And one of the, the negative effects that has actually happened is Bamiya, the, Bamiya was a region of tourist, tourism, so people were coming to see these Buddhas, and now they've made the decision, of course people aren't going to come uh, because there's nothing to see, the Buddhas are no longer there, so the region has lost a lot of money. And a lot of people who were involved in the destruction or who, who were forced, who say they were forced to be part of the destruction, regret what they did. Um, there you can see just a larger view of the colossal Buddha, the slightly smaller Buddha. So there were standing Buddhas, seated Buddhas, but the most famous was this colossal Buddha of 175 feet tall. There's a path for circumambulating along the head, so there are some videos of people, you can see them online, of people um, up in this upper area. But there is evidence that there was earlier destruction, earlier instances of iconoclasm. You can see the destruction on the legs, on the face, and then in 2001 there was this final destruction of these figures. So a very famous famous example of iconoclasm that involved Buddhism and also involved images along these trading routes. So this very much was on the west uh, 
side of the trading routes of the Silk Routes, but then we'll be focusing more on the East as we think about China. So thinking about China and how Buddhism was established, uh, it's important to think about how Buddhism becomes accepted into the Chinese culture. We've been thinking about Taoism and Confucianism and those very dominant philosophies in China. So how does Buddhism become part of the culture there? So Buddhism was introduced in China in approximately the 1st to 2nd century CE or AD. Um, legend has it that it was in 70 CE or AD, um, but it's probably more of these kind of rough dates of 1st to 2nd century CE. It was said that following a dream, the emperor sent emissaries in search of a golden man uh, who taught new doctrines. His emissaries followed the Silk Road and encountered two Indian monks. The monks brought sutras, which are Buddhist scriptures, to teach the emperor. And in a relatively short amount of time, by 400 CE, about 90% of northern Chinese had accepted Buddhism. However, this always depended on the emperor. Some emperors rejected it as a foreign religion, while other emperors were much more accepting of it. Uh, when Buddhism was worked into Chinese tradition, uh, of revering one's ancestors, family, it was much more accepted. When it was connected to Taoist traditions or Confucian traditions, it was much more accepted. And of course, we can see this in a number of religions when they are brought to different territories. They become localized in some way. And so that's very true of Buddhism in China. The earliest known image of the Buddha is actually in the United States. It's called the Brendage Buddha. It's an image of the historic Buddha. Uh, it's relatively small, a little over a foot, and it's from what we call the period of division or six dynasties, so a period of multiple rulers, uh, and it dates to 338 CE and has this gesture of meditation. But it's in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, so if you're in the United States, it is easy to see and is a very important early dated Buddha. So we know that this image comes from the very, very early period of Buddhist worship. And of course, because it is very small, it's portable. So it probably could be brought uh, with you like a portable altar to encourage meditation and prayer. So in that case, it's significant and it's gilded. So very a luxurious object. In addition to these smaller objects, we have these colossal rock cut images similar to the Bamiyan Buddhas we just saw. Um, thinking about also the caves that we saw at Ajanta in the last video, this idea of creating these large Buddhist structures that are carved into the living rock. So in this particular case, we're seeing a large historical Buddha, the Shakyamuni, with a smaller Buddha to the side. There would have been another Buddha over here. Um, most likely these three Buddhas constitute the Buddha of the distant past, the historical Buddha, and the Buddha of the future. So this tripart representation. There would have been a covering, like a cave wall that covered them, but you can see that over time the stone has eroded and now we can see these images fully. This comes from, you can see the northern and southern uh, Wei dynasties, uh, or northern and southern dynasties. So the northern Wei is up here, and that's where this cave structure is located. This is known as the Yonggang Caves near Shanxi in China from the second half of the fifth century, and as I noted, the front half has crumbled. This is not as large as the colossal Buddha, the Bamiyan Buddha, but it is 45 feet tall, the, the historical Buddha at center. Uh, and this was said to have been an offering after persecutions of Buddhists by Emperor Tai Wu. So as I said, there were some emperors that were more accepting of Buddhism and some that actively persecuted those who were following Buddhism. So for an emperor who was hoping to make an offering to repent for what had happened, this was what he was able to create. You can see that the Buddha has the Usnisa, has those large earlobes, but in just a few slides we'll talk about how the Buddha has become um, part of the Chinese culture. This is just another image to give you a sense of scale, so you can see the individuals entering into the uh, rock caves, and there were lots of images as part of these structure, these cave complexes. I'm just showing you one large section, one of the most famous sections. I also wanted to point out that behind the Buddha, you can probably just barely see these images, these multiple images of the Buddha replicated over and over again. And this was a particular miracle of the Buddha where he made this appearance of thousands of him, a thousand Buddhas that appeared. And so we often see these images of the Buddha and then many, many Buddhas behind him. And it's this idea of life as an illusion and reinforcing this idea of everything as an illusion. And so whenever you see the Buddha with these um, multiples behind him, it's referring to a specific miracle where he was reinforcing that idea.
So just, uh, we've, we, you've probably seen this in other videos from the class so far, but the idea of two forms of Buddhism that develop. So you have Theravada or Hinayana Buddhism, which stresses self-cultivation self for the purpose of attaining nirvana. So it's more of an individual path to nirvana. Uh, there's also more of this focus on uh, historic Buddha. And then there's Mahayana, which is known as greater vehicle. Um, it does not stress attaining nirvana for oneself, but Buddhahood or enlightenment for every being in the universe. And in Mahayana Buddhism, you tend to see multiple Buddhas, the idea uh, you tend to see more of these bodhisattvas, so you tend to see a bit more complex iconography when it comes to art history. So that's the important thing for this class, is that with Mahayana Buddhism, you do see the possibility of many more Buddhas, uh, so it does become a bit more complex. Uh, Mahayana is much more common in East Asia, and Theravada or Hinayana Buddhism is more common in areas of Southeast Asia. So we were looking at the Yungang caves, now we'll look at the Longmen caves. In this cave we can see not only sculpture but also painting. We can see the historic Buddha with attendance in a particular chapel, a uh, fairly large representation, 21 feet tall, and this dates to 523. Talking about the way, the characteristics of the Northern Way Buddha, um, we see full faces with a welcoming smile, full bodies, rounded shoulders, similar to those rounded shoulders we saw in the Mathura style, uh, exaggerated large hands, and then the sinocization of the Buddha, this making of the making the Buddha more Chinese, we see more of this flamboyant pointed mandorla, this kind of, I always call it a super halo in the background. So you can see this pointed quality that we often see in China around this time. And the monastic robes are identified as more Chinese, so the garments become more local as well. So obviously this period is still iconic. We were talking about in early Buddhism, it's aniconic. You see the Buddha represented by footsteps, by the umbrella, by the wheel, by the lion. And so as we move later, it's much easier to relate to a religion when you can see an icon, when you can see an image of the holy figure. And so Buddhism becomes very firmly iconic as we move into this later period. Looking at some relief sculptures and thinking about how Buddhism was becoming Chinese and becoming more local and respecting the family. We have a really interesting relief sculpture that comes from a chapel from the Longmen Grottoes or the Longmen Caves. And this is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. But you can see the Emperor Shao Wen represented here. It was commissioned by his son, Xuan Wu, who's showing it as an offering of reverence to his father and probably hoping that his father will continue on to nirvana, continue on to that point of extinction, um, and something that he probably hopes for himself, so something of a good work that he could do for himself and for his father. At this point, people are less focused on creating elaborate burials for themselves because in Buddhism, there's not that belief that that's important. You don't need to bring all those things with you because you're going to reach that point of nirvana. So it's interesting how the art patronage is much more focused on glorifying the Buddha, glorifying the worship of the Buddha, rather than glorifying oneself in the afterlife. So a clear difference from the types of artwork that we were seeing from the Han Dynasty and the Qin Dynasty. So in this particular case, of course, we have the emperor. We can see him with his entourage. Um, it has this nice kind of movement to it as they're moving towards the Buddha, because presumably there would be a Buddha at the center that these figures are moving towards within the chapel. We can zoom in on the emperor himself, and usually it's pretty easy to spot who the main figure is because the body is fully revealed. We can still see some uh, remnants of paint as well, so obviously this would have been much more colorful when it was first created. As we move on in Chinese history, we think about the Sui dynasty, which brings about more reunification of North and South in China. I wanted to point out a particular altar where we're seeing the appearance of the Amitabha Buddha. This is the Buddha of infinite light and the principal Buddha of the pure land sect of Buddhism. So this is connected to that Mahayana, that more kind of complex idea of Buddhism where we're going to start to see more and more Buddhas. The Amitabha Buddha became very popular because uh, he presented kind of an 
slightly easier access to nirvana, the, the idea that by praying to this Buddha, you would gain access to uh, the Western paradise or the pure land. And so the idea that uh, oftentimes these religions require a lot of work, a lot of prayer, the Amitabha became a very popular Buddha for presenting a slightly easier route to paradise. Um, we are seeing here a, a relatively small altar, 30 inches, so it is portable. It does have these kind of dangling aspects that would have created perhaps an element of sound. You can see the Buddha at center on a lotus blossom, very stylized lions on either side, um, presumably bodhisattvas in more princely garb. Uh, the lotus, again, an important symbol of Buddhism with the idea of the pure flower emerging from the muck of the swamp. And then an allusion perhaps to the Bodhi tree where the Buddha was able to attain enlightenment. You can see that the whole thing is made of cast bronze. So that idea of bronze working continues in China. We can see some details. You can see how elegantly and and the detailed quality of this work, the textures that were created, almost like jewelry hanging down from this altar. Um, but just this idea that the prayer to the Amitabha could continue no matter where you went by bringing this portable altar. With the Sui, you can see a great elegance and kind of thin quality to the figures. As we move on, I just wanted to focus on thinking about the Mogao Caves at Dunhuang. So this is a very famous system of caves, and it was these caves were commissioned mostly by officials and also by merchants, people who were working along the Silk Road. So this is the area that we're talking about, a relatively uninhabited area. Uh, and so this is China's largest Buddhist cave complex and it's located 25 miles from Dunhuang, but usually they're called the Mogao Caves at Dunhuang. Just to give you a sense of the setting, the number of caves, about 500 decorated caves at the, at the site, they span about one mile. And what's really wonderful about the Mogao Caves is that it shows us examples of art across various dynasties, various Chinese dynasties. So the Northern Wei, the Sui, two dynasties we've already seen, and then the Tong Dynasty, which we're about to move into, and we'll see an example of painting from that dynasty. So a really striking and very extensive cave complex, and a cave complex that conservators are actively trying to preserve because it was very covered with sand and the effects of being in the desert. So here we can see um, the Mogao Caves at, at Dunhuang in 1907. Um, there was this excavation around this time. Uh, they had heard rumors of a painting gallery in the desert. It took this particular uh, archaeologist a year on foot to reach Dunhuang and they were very impressed by the variety of things that they found, the artwork they found, including a library cave, which we can see here. <clears throat> Again, we see the traditions of the Buddha, such as the Usnisa, the halo, the mudra, and the larger mandola, mandorla, that kind of super halo that goes around the Buddha, uh, continuing. We can see also the mudras continuing, the meditative gesture is visible. You can see the wonderful painting that we see at the Mogao Cave, so both painting and sculpture. Um, here you can see the have no fear gesture, the wheel turning gesture. And then you can also see stories of the Buddha's life. You can see the Jatakas, those are featured also at Mugao. And then also victory is over Mara. So Mara is a demon, a figure that represents earthly desire and all that kind of distracts an individual from enlightenment, from Nirvana. And so this is a particular image from um, you can, from the Northern Zhou Dynasty where you can see the Buddha's victory over Mara's army. Here we can see the Paranirvana. I haven't shown any images of the Paranirvana, but this idea of the Buddha reclining, referring to the moment of the Buddha's implied death, but really the Buddha is moving on to Nirvana, so moving on to a better place. Here we can see Cave 196 that comes from the late Tang. So we start to see the Buddha changing in the Tang Dynasty, much fuller face, and also those rolls around the neck are often a good hint. In this particular case, you can see the teaching gesture of the Buddha. So thinking about that Tang Dynasty, a very, very important, very international moment for China. Again, great unity for China, uh, where you're unifying the North and the South after there had been these periods of more disunity or division.
from the Tang Dynasty, again, we're seeing these fuller, fleshier Buddha, um, very large Buddha. And so in this particular case, we're seeing this image of the Western paradise, the goal of praying to the Amitabha Buddha. Uh, this is where you want to go. But it also gives us a sense of imperial architecture under the Tang. So this very grand architecture, wide eaves. You can see the um, pillars along the base that allow this very open, airy kind of structure, a great symmetry and harmony to the structure. And I want you to keep this in mind because when we get to the Forbidden City from the Ming Dynasty, you get this sense of harmony and order also reinforced in the Forbidden City. So you see it here in, uh, in a Buddhist image and then you'll see it also in imperial architecture as well later on. Of course, we don't have imperial architecture from the Tang, so seeing this in painted form gives us a great sense of what structures would have looked like. So of course, here's the Amitabha Buddha. You can see an allusion to the tree, the Bodhi tree. You can see the Bodhisattvas around. The pigment on the Bodhisattvas has oxidized. I often receive questions from students, why is their skin so dark? But in fact, that was not intended. The pigment has just oxidized. So we see the Amitabha Buddha enthroned in the Western Pure Land, which is essentially his heaven or paradise in the West. And he is flanked by those bodhisattvas, those enlightened beings who have chosen to stay behind to help people like you and me make it to nirvana, make it to the point of enlightenment. Just comparing the two Amitabha Buddhas, you can see the Amitabha from the Tang Dynasty, much fuller, fleshier, those telltale rings around the neck, uh, and then versus the thinner, slightly more delicate Amitabha from the Sui Dynasty. So an interesting change has occurred. The Tang style will become very popular internationally. So we'll see it adopted in Korea and then also in Japan. So please keep that style in mind because I'll be referring to, oh, this Buddha looks like a Tong style Buddha. That's because these artists are seeing or were exposed to the style of Tong China. In addition to images of the Buddha, there's this kind of shift of how the stupa is reinterpreted in China, and so it takes the form of the pagoda. A pagoda is a form I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, the stupa, of course, contained relics, often relics of the Buddha's body or precious objects, and so the pagoda did something similar. You have this idea of it holding something precious, and so in the case of the giant great goose pagoda, which was built, it was inspired by a very early individual who um, had traveled and learned about Buddhism, and uh, an emperor, he told an emperor to build it, and so it does hold these Buddhist sutras, these Buddhist scriptures inside, so it holds these sacred texts. Um, it is very similar to the stupa in the sense that it's very an axis mundi, so it has this connection, heaven and earth, the terrestrial and the celestial, and also this idea of encouraging meditation through circumambulation. The final element of this video is just to remind viewers that uh, in China there was this great interest in ceramics and this great ability in ceramics. We saw it with the terracotta warriors very early on, this ability to mass produce and to um, use kilns to create very large quantities of ceramics. And this will only increase as time goes on. So in this particular case, we're seeing a tomb figure, a camel bearing musician. So there still are figures in tombs. People don't stop creating tombs. but People who become Buddhist are less, much less interested in packing them full of things. Um, but in this particular case, you see a camel bearing musicians, another example of a camel over here, using a tricolor glaze. So it's an earthenware, something that's been fired at a slightly lower temperature. These tend to be a couple feet tall, so they're somewhat substantial inside size. So it's a light colored earthenware clay, and then you use this multicolored glaze made from um, mineral pigments, a lead glaze with mineral pigments. So copper for green, the iron creates a brown and an amber, and the cobalt creates a blue, and it's fired at 800 to 1000 degrees centigrade. So a high temperature, but not as high as it's going to go with things like porcelain. You can see here um, a jar with handles from the Tang Dynasty dating to around the same time where you see much more of an interest in a simplicity of decoration. However, this is stoneware, so it's going to be fired at a slightly higher, um, higher temperature. So in this particular case, the glaze is rich in iron, but you can see this experimentation with different 
pigments with different glazes with different elements and so this is creating different effects and um, you can see how the ceramicists are exploring different styles and in this particular case it's the tea dust glaze and I'm just pointing out that this is a, a fairly simple and rustic style and the simplicity and rusticity that we see will remain popular in certain areas of Chinese ceramics we'll also see it adopted in places like Korea and China in Japan and so here I just have a very basic layout of how earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain are fired. Um, porcelain uses a very refined white clay called kaolin, or sometimes called kaolin clay. Uh, but you can see how they progressively go to these higher temperatures. And the Chinese are really um, very impressive in terms of creating these kilns that can fire at these incredibly hot temperatures and can do so consistently. Um, so we'll start talking about in future videos the first appearances of porcelain. All right, but in this in the next video that comes up, we will talk about Buddhism and uh, in Korea and in Japan. All right, thank you.